Let me make sure. Yeah, I just All got right, Marcus, it says we are live, my friend. So we must be live. <laughs> must be live. I believe we it. We are live. It That's is our Let's night. Go out, I got Marcus Doc Wilson coming out of Louisville. What's up, man? Yeah, it's so good to see you. We shared a quarterback room for a year. <laughs> man, we had Gromos. We had Heels. We had Tim Richardson. Man, we had some characters in there with Coach Christopher, didn't we? Man, every last one of those rooms every year. But Christopher, everybody had their own personality. And uh, I, I had to... Uh, touch base with Joe Peebles because because I couldn't remember all the quarterback coaches we had. So I yeah, I, I didn't remember all of the, the different rooms. But yeah, Christopher. Yeah. And I don't I certainly don't mean to leave Joe out. Oh but yeah. One thing I want you guys to know, I wonder if Marcus remembers this. I'm 99% sure it was before the Tennessee game, my senior year, your first year. Uh -huh. And we had, I don't know what possessed us. But we were going to see which quarterback could throw the ball the furthest on a Friday in pregame. Absolutely, I remember that. Well, then you absolutely remember that you out threw all of us by about 10 to 15 yards, and I think you held back a little bit. No. I don't know if the ball <laughs> traveled about 80 to 85 yards. I could be underestimating, but my point in bringing this up is y'all hadn't seen athleticism until you've seen Marcus on the football field. Uh, yeah. It's my pleasure for us to be uh, teammates for that year. That was fun. Awesome. Yeah, that was fun. You know, that later proved, um, you know, my books as I'm as reflective and as critical as I am of my talent. Thank you for the compliment. But man, that proof, you know, I didn't start the ability to play quarterback is to harness that power. <laughs> so I didn't learn that tool until really my my senior year. Uh, some of the guys still today, man, they joke about, they have a, uh, Daryl Griffin has a broken pinky. That's, uh -huh. I mean, you see him today, man, it's, it's kind of just crazy looking, but he blames that pinky. Well, he gives that pinky's credit to me and uh, Tremaine Anderson, several guys, man, you know, just the heat that that I, that I threw the ball. That's right, that's right. Back up. You, you live in learn learning where you could see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was definitely, definitely a positive on, on that uh, on that field before. I think I threw it, man. It was way into the stands uh, at some point. I don't remember exactly, but man, man. no people Marcus, was close. Marcus, you got folks rolling in here. We got to show some love. What's up? I can't see, man. I, I need to. I fix got it. you. We got OJ Fleming in the house. OJ. We got Coach Jappy Oliver in the house. Jappy's in the house. What's up, Jack? We got Dwayne Jones, Coach Gary Shepard, oh, yeah. Pat Fitch, Greg Simmons. He fits. Joe Peebles is in Joe the Peebles. house. What's up, QB? What's up, baby? Man, you got a you got a room full, and there are more, more showing up. I don't come on in and help me remember what uh, I don't remember. Well, <laughs> Marcus, I want to know how is it that you got out of the heart of basketball country and made your way to campus in the late 80s? How did that, first of all, how did Louisville, how did Kentucky not get you? And second of all, I know you were a multi-sport guy. How did you end up in football? Well, I was multi-sport, um, uh, ran track, um, play basketball. I had absolutely no skill in basketball. I, I, was, I was pretty quick. So I, I, I mean, I rolled the oak, sat the bench on my basketball teams, but my coaches in high school would put me in when there would be a, uh, a you know, just a dominant scorer. Um, so I would, my, my, my job would be to uh, defend that guy, mm -hmm. you know, just to be the quick guy, be in his face, use my five fouls against him. But Skill-wise, man, I'd get the last 13, 14, 15 seconds. And, of course, the coaches would use me as an example of always hustling, always going full out, always practicing hard. So, you know, that, that, you know, I was glad to be that guy because I was always that guy. But basketball, I had no chance. That's my point. No chance. 
Well, Basketball they, they, knew, yeah. they knew that you had that athleticism and it's hard to keep up. Yeah, so track wise, track I wasn't that fast as most everybody who knew I wasn't blazing fast, but mm -hmm. quarterback man, I um, there were multiple schools in the area, smaller schools that wanted my talents. Uh, I was an, I was an all state free safety, but I was an all district quarterback. Mm -hmm. But of course, in that time, um, African American quarterbacks wasn't as prolific and uh, wasn't as um, there weren't as many. And so I was determined to play it and was told that I couldn't and I, and I wasn't able to. So I was determined to prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. So all those schools in Michigan, even early on, um, wanted me to play cornerback. And I told them I'm not playing quarterback. So they completely left. So it was down to uh, University of Kentucky and Vanderbilt. And with EJ being there, I believed that uh, I had a chance of playing at, Van at Vanderbilt. I didn't really believe the whole... Um, uh, UK facility, I mean, the U whole UK uh, team and era that I would play quarterback. I thought that, you know, just in my spirit of things, I, I felt that I wouldn't play at quarterback. So um, I made that decision. You know, it, it's you bring up a, a, such a good point and such a, a leader of our teams back then, Eric Jones. Oh, yeah. Of course, for those of you who didn't play with Eric or didn't know, don't know Eric. <laughs> Cold as ice. Extremely talented quarterback out of uh, DeKalb County, Georgia. He goes up to Northwestern. He's not happy and not getting to play much. He and his best buddy from high school are up there, but ultimately he ends up in the black and gold and ends up being our quarterback and just had some outstanding years. But he really was, whether he knew it or not, was a real trendsetter. Um, you know, Van Heflin played quarterback for us in the 70s, uh, African American, phenomenal athlete. Sadly, we lost him this past year. Yes. But, but Marcus, you're so right. And it takes, it takes not just talent, but it takes that, um, I'm going to call it a controlled cockiness, a right. confidence about your abilities, because it would have been easy for you to fold your convictions and go to a different school somewhere else. Absolutely. But I, I've never told you, but I certainly applaud and mentally thought that they're just at the time you were setting some trends in the 80s. But I want to pause that for a second because we got a fight going on and I oh. call it a fight. First of all, Daryl Griffin's in the house. The Bradley's in the house. Joe Peoples, Joe Peoples said he we're going to get to your singing now that you sang at his wedding. Yeah. Jaffe says that you sang at his wedding. He appreciates that. Yeah. But here's the beef. Joe Peoples DJed the pre-party for Jaffe Oliver's wedding and still hadn't gotten paid <laughs> for that. Now, whether you're part of that or hey. not, I just you need to be aware of the comments, Marcus, because this is involving you, my friend. <laughs> and of course, you know what? Around, but I want to talk about because I remember hearing that lovely voice of yours back in the day. Yeah, where man. did the ability to sing? When did you start harnessing and cultivating the ability to to sing? Well, everyone in my family grew. Up, I grew up in church. Um, um, everyone in my family sang except for me because I was always involved in every sport. Um, so growing up, all my family sang, my mom, my grandparents, my brothers and sisters, you know, they all sang in the choir. So one time uh, our church was having a, um, a family talent show. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I sang with my family and the choir director heard me in that group. And she said, you're the one that needs to be singing. And so at that point I started singing in the church choir um, but I'd always sing around the house. And, and how old were you when the, that talent was uncovered? 10, 11, mm -hmm. yeah, 10, 11, 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, to this day, you know, I, I, you know, I thank her and I thank God, of course, for uh, giving me that talent, but exposing me and giving me practice for that talent. That's, a, that's what it's all about, being able to fine tune it. And uh, by the all time. Right. Take college, us, yeah. Take us to the mid 80s. Who were some of your 
acts that you would try to either mimic their skills. <laughs> Patrick says Luther Vandross. Yeah. But who are some of your inspirations musically? Um, it, it was a good blend of Luther because it was just so smooth. Uh, but even before that, uh, the old Motown sound. And I've always had a big voice. Mm -hmm. And I used that, fortunately, and, and giving God the credit, I had a big voice and it could get bigger and it could get bigger and bigger. A lot of times, a lot of artists, they have a big voice, but then they'll go falsetto, which is, you know, softer, right, right, right. voice. I was able to hit those high notes with a full voice. And so that gave me a little bit of a distinction, just like some of the old Motown, um, um, Donny Hathaway's, um, you know, all of the, uh, the OJs and the Temptations and Stevie Wonder. So I tried to emulate, well, I took those sounds and I heard those sounds. Mm -hmm. And as my mind and body and spirit started to come up with my own, it really was a good blend of all of those. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Daryl throws out Howard Hewitt. Howard Hewitt. Yeah. Great voice. Great voice. I, I yeah, I opened up for him and I've, I've traveled the world and open and, and been all over the world with, uh, with my singing talent. So I, I, what, a, what about the fellow from Xavier high school in Cincinnati, they used to call one donut. Was he an influence on your singing voice? Mike Healy. <laughs> he was an influence, but not on my singing. <laughs> of course, guys, I'm referring to Mike yeah. Healy, who's been on the show. Mike and Marcus came yeah. in at the same time. And man, having the two of them in the same quarterback room was just, it was a treat. Just a treat. And, uh, man, that, that whole quarterback room, man, was just, I can still see those guys and just, I see Joe Peebles more often than anybody. But man, when I see that guy or see Mike Healy or we, we touch base online, I just light up because, you know, fond memories, great times, um, you know, still some of my best friends today, even though I haven't seen them for 20, 30, whatever, 35 years, just great time. Well, let me ask you, Marcus, you came in, oh, hey, T. Banks, the pride of Greensboro, Thanks. Alabama in the house. And do you know where everyone is from? Well, these are all folks who've been on the show. All right, right, right. Okay. Well, I better, I better remember them, but I can't forget my Alabama guys like T. Uh, Marcus, your recruiting class mm -hmm. had maybe the largest number of African American signees, maybe up to that point ever at, at Vanderbilt for football. Right. But we were pre-internet, pre-cell phone. And it was harder back then to make connections unless you actually saw each other in person, like at a recruiting visit or at a camp or things like that. So I guess my question to you is, how quickly did you bond with the other fellas in your recruiting class? And how important was that to you coming to basically an all white campus and in a fishbowl of being a football player on a small campus? Oh yeah, it was uh, quickly and crucial. Um, you know, of course, as a as a group, you know, we were all there for a week or two before the uh, the senior class were there, right. and so you know, just culturally, um, you know, of course, we meshed with everyone, but culturally, you know, there is at, at times just a, a one off or a two off, or in this case, a twelve off. And there were times where we would just sit back and chill and stay up all night and um, converse and, and talk about where we've come from, go to different parties. And also 1988, man, you know, I have stories. We still joke about what I had on, what type of shoes I had on, what type of jeans I had on, what type of jeans Greg had on, you know, that, all that stuff is just, you know, it, it's just a quick recall. I remember those days uh, like it was yesterday. I can't remember if you were a pledge back then, but were you, did you pledge the fraternity or you were just buddies with those guys? Yeah, I was just buddies with, with those guys. As a matter of fact, everybody thought I was a uh, Kappa with them, but I didn't pledge. I ended up pledging grad, grad chapter uh, three years ago, but no, I didn't. Know. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, it's, you know, one of the impressive things about any buddies group, any group of guys who 
who bond, whether they're athletes or, or whatever else they have in common, is is the ability to to have each other's back. Absolutely. No matter what's going on, no matter who's in trouble or needs help, you don't even have to, to ask. And right. here, here's here's my observation of your close, that close-knit group of athletes that you guys were was one of the things that I always appreciated, whether we're in the locker room, on the field, in in on campus, was laughter, was humor. And there you could be having the worst of days. But it just seemed like you guys had each other's backs to pick each other up. Yeah, and and don't get me wrong, man. It it, it was of course those thirteen guys, the twelve of us. Um, but it it was a whole team, really. You know, even to this day, I'll see, you know, Steve Meads, and we'll hug like, you know, we, you know, so you know, we were just brothers, man. But you know, with these African American guys, we'd walk on campus, and you know, there were times when we were walking on one side of the sidewalk and there were some Caucasian females that would come across and they quickly moved to the side and put the head down and just, it seems as if they had a fear of us. So of course, to get through that, we'd make a joke of it or you're like, wow, really? You know, what did I do, man? Did you put your deodorant on? What's the, you know, we joke with, with, within ourselves to say, yeah. we know, man, that's not right. But to not cause a scene, not make a scene, we'd make jokes about it. We keep it moving, we make it light. And then we go to class, you know, or go to the cafeteria. But uh, yeah, crazy things would happen. Yeah. You know, about that's, it. That's, yeah. that's the sad reality of, of yeah. campus life in the 80s, yeah. probably into the 90s. Heck, maybe even to a certain extent, even today. Um, but my brother's on the team and my brother's on the field. Uh, uh, Bro, then uh, Richard Signs. I mean, you, you, man, Gromos, man. It, it's just, it's, it's, it's a team. It's, it really is the melting pot. It's just how America and all the world should be, anyway. Well, well, that's what I was gonna to ask you, and I don't mean for our entire conversation to just be about race and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm glad, but I'm glad but, we're talking. About it. But it, it, it is. It's a healthy conversation. It's a good thing to talk about. And to for maybe the younger guys who may watch our conversation here, you know, we're there in the late 80s, 30 plus years ago. Man, we're getting old. But anyway, um, uh, it is our hope that a lot of the things that the African-American athlete had to deal with in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and as we progress, maybe they're not dealing with all of those issues today. I'm not saying it's perfect by any stretch. But maybe for what you guys went through and the guys after you went through, maybe that helped with things. And I don't know if you've ever talked with your friends, your buddies about stuff like that, but I'm just sharing with you my observations. Absolutely. I, of course, I believe it helped, even if it were just for the small um, culture at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've always felt that, uh, you know, coming in, you know, I, I was raised by my grandparents and my brothers and sisters and my mom, mm -hmm. but a lot of those guys, Carlos and, and uh, Corey, they came in a whole lot more mature than I was. So Cor Carlos was, man, he was a man, uh, he was, you know, he was just much more wise with his awareness of his African-Americans, of his, of his Blackness, and even, you know, mm -hmm. me, I was just a wide-eyed, bushy-tailed young boy who got a scholarship to play football. Mm -hmm. You know, but, you know, Carlos, man, he, he just helped me in that time, of course, with his vocal um, resistance with the Ole Miss and the whole flag. Mm -hmm. And I, at, at 17, 18, I'm like, man, what are you talking about? What's, what's going on? You know, so well, it was just a whole lot more awareness that just because he was so, so yeah. much mature in that area and some of those guys where it just made me. So his presence helped us come along and help us you know, raise our awareness of what yeah. we on the campus. You, you know, for, and, and that's, you know, that obviously that's Carlos's story. Maybe one day he'll come on and share it. But I want to talk about that situation for just a minute or two from your perspective. You mentioned Ole Miss and Carlos and, and something that happened. Do you recall enough to share just a snippet so people who weren't aware back in the day of what Carlos dealt with Maybe you could share a little bit of that. And I'll get Carlos on here to tell yeah, the whole story. Because, yeah, yeah I, I can't. But from what I, my perspective, of course, um, Ole Miss, the Rebels, 
They mm -hmm. were part of their persona, part of their um, exuberation for their team was raising the rebel flags. Yeah. You know? yeah. and so, you know, somebody interviewed Carlos to my knowledge and he yeah. um, said something about it. Mm -hmm. And and I, for one, you know, wasn't as aware of the of the history or it wasn't at the top of my mind uh, of the history of the rebel flag, but Carlos was all over it and yeah. he made him aware of it and he let him have it. And, yeah. he, and so, it, it, man, you just do nothing. You, you can, how can you applaud a kid who's 18? And he's that aware. Um, yeah. And, and but it, so it, it that caused a whole lot of ruckus, yeah. of course, <laughs> with the rebel team and uh, as yeah. it should and as it should have. And of course, all that stuff should have been abolished and yeah, yeah gone anyway. So and, and, and Los, if I remember correctly, was originally from Memphis, Memphis, much closer yeah. to, to the Ole Miss uh, campus in Oxford and the culture coming out of Ole Miss and their um, alums or whatever, whoever they were, but you're right. Carlos had, I think a lot more maturity as an 18, 19 year old than most of us. Absolutely. Most of us are knuckleheads and just happy to be there and <laughs> do our thing. But yeah. you're, you're right. Carlos, again, raising more awareness of things that shouldn't yeah. be still ongoing. And Marcus, we got Clint Small in the house at the table. Hey, what's up, baby? Because of course I've got Doc, Marcus, Doc Wilson, coming out of the Plano, Frisco area, north north of Dallas, and let's let's back up or pause our Vanderbilt conversation a little bit that time period. Doc, I want you to share about your beautiful family. I want you to tell folks what you do these days for folks who aren't aware. There's all kind of athletes in that house, and we need to know about them. Yeah, man. All, well, they're out of the house now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> My youngest is a uh, junior in college. He's playing at uh, Lindsey Wilson. Uh, mm -hmm. He was recruited as a uh, cornerback. Mm -hmm. uh, they moved him to free safety, which is where I uh, I made my, my mark in high school. Uh, but, man, he's just having a – well, he's coming off of injury. He was redshirted, and then, of course, the COVID year. Um, but that program as an NAIA, I believe, uh, Lindsey Wilson, yeah. Um, they, I mean, they're, I mean, they're, all, they are the Alabama of that, uh, of that, uh, of that, uh, of that division. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's, um, in his third year working his way up the program. They, they won it his first year. They came in second place the second year. And, um, I'm not sure what happened, uh -huh. but yeah, they, you know they're they're pretty good in the they're pretty high in the program in, in that division. I had two other sons. Uh, they play football in college as well. One at University of Memphis. He's already graduated. The other one at University of Florida. Uh, he's a wide receiver and he's uh, actually pursuing. He has a couple of tryouts with a uh, Corey's actually training him. Corey Harris. Yeah. So he um, he's doing a bunch of things to to keep his uh, football dream alive. So three of us, all, well, the three boys all play college football. And one is still yeah. playing. And then I have a daughter, of course, she uh, didn't, she went to Belmont and got a nursing degree and she's making all the money in the world and doing her thing. Man, but that's that's... My, uh, my lovely wife, she's a uh, personal trainer, which is half of the reason why, uh, you know, but first of all, I have three boys in the house, had three boys in the house. So I always had to keep these guns right just to show them who's who and what's what. And then my wife, man, is just as lovely as, as more than I deserve. So she's beautiful, talented, smart, uh, personal trainer, nutritionist, uh, mm -hmm. an author, uh, personal, you can see all these trees behind me. She's a uh, interior designer mm -hmm. and just uh, the love of my life. So she's mm. good people. Oh, that's, I was going to say, Marcus, how is it that you appear to be either less weight than you were at Vanderbilt or within five pounds? And I bet, I bet she well, Hey, you know what though? I, 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 I brag sometimes and say, oh, man, I'm in the best shape of my life only because I can't come home fat. <laughs> but I got to ask, how did son number one become a Gator? Who who authorized that? No, no, uh, um, not University of Florida. Uh, actually, you know, Cedric Douglas' son is a wide receiver at, uh, at uh, you know, the old quarter, young quarterback. He's a okay. wide receiver at um, at uh, University of Florida. But, I got you. I got but, you. But no, he wasn't a Gator. He was a... Uh, I'm sorry. 
Uh, I'm sorry, University of Fort Lauderdale. That's what I'm okay. Gonna tell okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Hey, I um, told my sons, you're right. They can't be mad. I was, I was dead serious. They can't wear orange in the house. No orange. That's in the house. Right. Right. That that was the main rule. No orange. In the house. No kidding. No kidding. Can buy oranges. <laughs> Whatever. That's fun. That's fun. Marcus, we got Dwayne reminded me that the Keystone Cops yeah. sold the hotel the night before the game at Old Miss, the week that Carlos was interviewed. Really? Okay, that was okay. That was yeah. And we got Christy Howe. Hey, Christy, thank you for joining Christy us Howell. always. Yeah, man. Uh, Marcus, let's let's get back to your first few months as a freshman at Vanderbilt. Obviously, you you we've got a a pretty stacked quarterback room, um, but from a red shirt or a playing. Do you remember conversations either with Coach Brown, Coach Christopher, whoever it was, about where you were going to fit in your freshman year? Freshman year, um, I, there really was no conversation. Uh, it, it was going in that I was, you know, going to be uh, redshirted. And uh, I, I knew the talk of at some point getting me on the field to in, at whatever position. But of course, we already had the talents of Eric Jones and then the talents of um, John Gromos. Yeah. So that second year, yeah. as they were trying to get me on the field, um, you know, as a runner, as a blocker. You went to receiver, if I remember. I went to, yeah, I went to receiver. As yeah. a matter of fact, I played in the game where John Gromos was quarterback. He threw a pass to um, uh, Gaines, Brad Gaines. And that's when I was I was to the right of that hit when Chucky Mullins uh well that was that was our my senior year, it was 89. Yeah. That was in the first quarter. We yeah. were driving, Gromos had us driving down, yeah. and that was on a third down play. You're right, the pass to Gaines where Chucky hit him at the weird angle. And speaking of that, that that was the most surreal, bizarre sporting event that I had ever been around Absolutely, and, yeah. and you're on the field at the time and my recollection is we didn't know that he was hurt like that to begin with coach Brown's trying to decide to go for it or kick the field goal so we're just kind of standing around and then as the moments wore on what what do you recall if, if you recall that time you're absolutely right. There were there were no inclinations of how serious it was. Of course, I ended up getting carted off, but we're in the heat of the game. We felt for him, and but to no degree did we ever think that you know he would be paralyzed. Yeah. And to see his story progress or degress over the years, you know, you always just go back to that moment, man. You know, it's almost like when the towers. Where, you know, where, where, where were you? Uh, yeah. I know where I was when, you know, when it happened. Yeah. So, it's, you know, and Brad, God bless his, you know, heart, man. He's just crazy as he is and it was, and man, he's, yeah, that just broke his heart. So, and I get it. Yeah. Um, let's stay on that second year. You know, you've got Watson Brown your first couple of years. Uh -huh. And then in the, the, your third year would have been Donardo. We'll get to him in just a minute. But with Groms as our quarterback in 89, threw quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, David Crop says to tell you hello. He just Poppy. joined us. What's up, baby? And Marcus, you got all kind of love tonight. That's awesome. So many folks. And there'll be some more rolling in. What was it like for you having played quarterback for several years, high school and coming into college? Mm -hmm. And I know you just wanted to get on the field and contribute. But going out to play wide receiver, which I don't know how much you had of that before then, what was that transition like? Well, man, you know, it, it was pretty much um, a summary of my whole college career uh, mm -hmm. from socially, um, mm -hmm. mentally, intellectually, and of course, athletically. From my freshman year, I knew one thing, and, I, and it was an ever-increasing ever increasing knowledge. There was a whole lot I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And it was just, I, it's, it's almost as if my brain said, poof. Yeah. So I became, even just listening to the fellas and, you know, uh, there was so much I didn't know. So I, I became just the ultimate observer. 
Mm -hmm. So that's how, you know, I teach and that's how I've learned. You got, you've got to watch, you've got to be there and just watch from the times I was freshman year carrying a clipboard, uh, watching EJ, and then second year watching Gromos, being on the field, playing receiver, knowing how to set up the routes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, watching in practice the steps of the linemen, all of that was a crucial integral part to what kind of quarterback I would be, what kind of person I would be, how I read the room, and even now how I, you know, conduct my business and, and, and sales, reading, seeing, observing, uh, analyzing, deducing, figuring out, you know, all of it was just a continual practice of how I live, how I, how, how, and it started that very first day, August 13, 1988, man, I am behind, I am far behind and I need to catch up. And so that whole mindset of anything and everything, no matter what was going on, I didn't know it. So I had to figure it out and I had to learn it. Somebody knew it. So I'm watching that person who knew it. And then now I know it. Well, guys, for those of you who don't know Marcus now or didn't know Marcus back then, he's not going to sit here and tell you what I'm about to tell you. He may have been behind when he came to Vanderbilt, but it did not take this man very long to catch up and not only just to survive, but to thrive. Because by the time you were a junior and a senior, Marcus, you were setting records. You started for two and a half years the connection that you and Bunk had was uncanny okay. in those games. And I want to talk about that evolution as you just started talking about. You go back to quarterback, you're gaining some confidence, you're now going to start against LSU. And not only did you start against LSU, but you were recognized as the SEC Player of the Week. Now, mm -hmm. before that game, or before any game, were you the type that got nervous and couldn't eat? Or were you the type that was rah-rah? Or what? describe your personality yeah. the day of the game and how did you approach getting mentally ready? Well, craziest thing, I, I tell my, uh, you know, this is just an internal thing. I didn't really believe it, but I believed it. I would get on the field and as a quarterback, we're taught or we, we've learned or I've learned to, to be even keeled. Mm -hmm. Nothing gets me too high. Nothing gets me too low. I'm going to throw interceptions, but I can come back and throw, throw a touchdown. Mm -hmm. But on that field, when I before a game, I'm dancing and I'm telling myself in the, in, the, in, in the end zone, I'm the baddest boy on this field. I, I am. I, I'm, I'm the best player on this field. Mm -hmm. And what I do today is going to help me help my team win or it's going to help my team lose. Mm -hmm. So in that, in that moment, I have to know, you just have to know it. So that's where the cockiness and the arrogance comes from. It, it, of course, you know, it needs to be internal, but inside, man, dude, I'm, I'm, dude, I'm going at, even after every game, when we lost, I would look up at the crowd and I'd say, I'm coming back. And when I come back, we're winning. And that's just, a, you know, as a quarterback, you know, how I prepared myself, how I prepared myself mentally. I was, I, I was a beast in the weight room because we ended up running the option. I was going to take more hits. I said, no, I'm going to okay. give hits. Yeah. They're going to hate running into Marcus Wilson. I just, it, it, it just, now harnessing that throwing ability. Oh man, that, that, Took a whole lot more time than just self-talk. <laughs> sure, sure. But that was what I could do, what I could control was what I could control. And just taking over mentally, getting my guides in the right spot, you know, minimizing the um, illegal motions, you know, all of that stuff was, is, is all mental. And uh, that's how I approached the game, making sure. So I'm a quiet dude. I was quiet. You know, the guys that I was, you know, even in high school, I would, I, I don't do celebrations when I score. You just give the ball to the referee. When I was leading the SEC in, in scoring, man, just give the ball to the ref and get over to the sideline. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm a quarterback. That's right. That's I right. Talk to, my, talk to my lineman, tell him the great job blocking. All right. Hey, great. You know, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then get back and get ready for the next play. When you entered Vanderbilt in the fall of 88, how old were you? 17. 
I don't know if you guys appreciate Marcus was a year behind in age, six months to a year than the folks in his class. Oh yeah. And the mental maturity, then the physical maturity, and then the confidence all kind of built upon itself. So the LSU game, in my opinion, yep. when you get the first start, but I'm going to skip around a little bit. And I want to go to how much do you appreciate what Corey Harris did in the Florida game at the end? <laughs> I'm not saying it to embarrass you. But we all no, no, no. Play. Oh, yeah. We I remember, all remember the play. I want you to yeah. set the scene and share that memory. Man, there's because I have so many uh, humiliating stories. When I threw an interception in Alabama, man, dude, that I tried to tackle the guy, the guy came out of nowhere. And, Smack me. I was on the ESB. I was on the top plays of getting blocked by, um, I forget his name. It was crazy. But anyway, that play, we were going into the sideline. It's like it happened yesterday. We were going into the sideline, tight end, Pat Acos was on the, on the right-hand side. Uh, we were running 34-5, I believe is what, what it was. Fake to Carlos. Pat was supposed to block that first guy. And I was going around the full end. Then at that time, I make a decision on the corner if I pitch or not. Mm -hmm. Well, Pat, God bless his soul, he uh, either missed the block or he didn't take, didn't do the block or whatever. He probably got you know, misconstrued and went on to the linebacker. He smacked the linebacker when we looked at it on film, but he didn't block the guy that I was thinking he was going to block. All the right. conference in the world. So right. I'm looking past that guy. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I'm looking past the defensive lineman, expecting Pat to block him, that guy smacked me so hard, I fumbled the ball backwards. Corey picked it up as it bounced toward, towards him. We're, remember, we're going towards the right sideline. And then he picked it up, made a U-turn, flipped all the way, all the way back on the other side of the, uh, uh, the sideline. I think he ended up running 100 yards, 120 yards. It was 52 from one yeah. side to the other side, and yeah. then another 45 to 55 yards uh, down the sideline. So, man, it was a great play on him. I didn't see it. Cause I was on the ground kind of hurting from that hit. Um, but I heard the crowd and I heard the roar of, you know, it's kind of a, it's an, it's an escalating roar. I yeah. remember distinctly, I threw like a 50 yard pass to bunk mm -hmm. and it just, it almost, it seems as if the ball was going to be on time. It was going to go. So the crowd just ever increasingly started to get louder and louder and louder and louder. There was that same scene with Corey as he made it past the other uh, left tackle, and then he made it to the sideline, and then he made it down 20 yards, and then 30, 40, 50. The crowd just went crazy. You know, it, it's one of the more unique plays, I think, in the last 50 years uh, of Vanderbilt yes, football. Uh, lo I'd love to see a, a copy of the play. I hadn't seen it in so, so long. Uh, With a kind of topic. Corey, I want to talk about just one more game, and then I've got some other things to really yeah. share with you or want you to share. I want you to talk about, as a quarterback, when you have that connection with a wide receiver in a particular game or a particular series, that you guys are just locked in, and it's rare that you can get to the level that you and Bunk got to in that Tennessee game, but to the extent that you can set us in that situation, share with us what, if anything, communication-wise was going on. You know, um, let me make note that I'm talking after practice, on the weekends, there were times Bunk and I would just go to an open field and just run plays and just throw the ball. He, man, he would run routes until I got tired. He would just run, run, run. And my son, the receiver, he reminds me of a lot of him. He just runs. And I'm like, and I'm like dude, are you going to run forever? And it's full speed for we'd be out there an hour or two. And mm -hmm. I'm throwing. So that time after time after time, practice upon practice upon practice upon practice, just messing around. So I'm getting to, so innately or internally 
uh, unspokenly, there were there was a communication, there was timing. We both knew the play, so we knew. Of course, they they were a little bit more fearful of our option game, so they put 11, 10 in the box. So it was one on one with Bunk and that corner, who could not guard him to save his life. Not guard him to save his life. Uh, and the guys, we're, when we say Bunk, we're talking about Clarence Civilian coming out of Flint, Michigan, and he's part of Marcus's recruiting class, and. My recollection of Bump was really three things. He was quiet. Yeah. He had a, a Fred Bolitnikoff ability to catch a ball. Just it didn't matter where it was. Yeah. But he also had the ability to just get open. Just get open. And yeah. It's just he, he wasn't the fastest guy in the world, but he didn't know it on the field. Those, he just had those abilities. Um, but that day against Tennessee, that that Tennessee, I don't remember, I think he was a cornerback, had no chance whatsoever. And when you and Bunker in the huddle, is it a look? Is it a comment? Is it nothing you just knew? Well, no, because at that time it was my senior year, my fifth year, yeah. and all these times and months and years of practice, we knew the play. It was a fake option. I dropped back three yards, pump fake. And then I just had to put the ball in the right place. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, as quarterback, I'm supposed to put it on the outside shoulder on the sideline. Yeah. It was so wide open. Some of my throws weren't on the perfect spot. They were internal, even inside on the hash. Yeah. He was so wide open. He would just belly in, come get the ball. But he was that much open because one, yeah. their scheme, two, his route, three, as long as I didn't screw it up and overthrow it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just yeah, but, but one of those games. That we had a, I think we had a 92 yarder. It mm -hmm. was a one, two, three ball. I put the air yeah. under it, put it on the sideline and he ran under it. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. Oh yeah. And a quarterback, I know you loved it, but we want to welcome Tom Fitz. Number seven is in the house. Fitz. And we got Coach Gene Windham. Hey, Coach, thank you for joining us. Of course, we you got mean? Marcus, Doc Wilson. We're, I want to talk a little bit about the transition from Coach Watson Brown, your first two years, to Coach DiNardo, your last three years. Huge difference in personalities. Oh, ho, 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 time out. Derek Sartor is in the house from the DR. Oh, no. He's late from oh. New Orleans. He's been neck deep in barbecue all day. Man, I think he got barbecue sauce on my screen. My. <laughs> Marcus, take us to that contrast between the two coaches, their styles, their approach. Night and day. And I'm not, I'm not talking about 12 a.m. to 12.01. I'm talking about 12 a.m. to 12 noon. Mm -hmm. We loved us some Coach Brown, man. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we would go through a brick wall. It was just, you know, the great, he, he's just a great personality, personable. But in contrast, Jerry D, you know, you get him alone in a room and you'd have that personality. But as soon as he come, comes out of that office, it was, ah, what are you doing? You know, it was just that stern. And I believe as a program, as much as we missed and fought for and said we weren't going to play and all of that we needed it yeah. we needed that contrast with uh, jerry d he was just a uh, a disciplinarian mm -hmm. stern no nonsense i mean you, if you're not one minute early you're going home on a bus by yourself mm -hmm. you know it was just that no nonsense um type of director and directive you know almost yeah. In these political days, it was uh, it was a democracy mm -hmm. and a dictatorship. <laughs> yeah, and that's what it is. That's what now, it was. Were you were you a survivor of bell buckle? I survived the craziest thing. Yes, I survived and 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 thrived the two a days, three a days. But there was one bell buckle. Uh, alluding back to the practices, Bunk and I, man, we would run and and practice those uh, shuttles that they had us run. Mm -hmm. We would do that. Crazy, crazily, all the time. But one bell buckle year, we uh, we failed the test. 
Bonk and I, the two leaders, senior leaders, we failed the test. We think, of course, you know, even to, the, to this day, we think there was, a, there was a miscalculation on the rest time because we had practiced, man, but I'm not gonna make any excuses now. 30, at, at 52, right, right. I don't believe I failed that test, but the record shows we failed that test. Of course, mm -hmm. we had to uh, get up at six o'clock in the morning to go do some extra running. Mm -hmm. He let us have it that whole year, man. My leaders, my, my, my quarterback, this is, these are supposed to be my captains and you know, we failed the test and blah, 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 blah. So I was determined every morning, man, I'm gonna prove him wrong. So it was just an extra chip. He made sure we all had chips sure, on us. Sure, sure. Um, Bill up? Sullivan says to tell you hello. Sully, what's up, Sully? Marcus, you finished your senior year. You've completed your, your time playing at, at Vanderbilt. You're on your way to graduating. When you graduated, when you were finished with your time at Vanderbilt, mm -hmm. at that time as a 22, 23 year old, 20, probably 23 year old. 21, did, 22, that was, yeah. Did you have a good taste in your mouth or a sour taste in your mouth about your experience playing college ball? Great taste playing college ball, absolutely. The best experience ever, um, wins, losses, losses, blowouts, mm -hmm. fights against UT, the camaraderie with the guys. The playing college ball was, uh, was, was, and of course we would want to have more wins, but that experience was, um, I couldn't complain and I wouldn't trade that in for anything. And that it leads me, I'm glad to hear that it leads me to my next question which is gonna be the subject of next week's panel. It's about the transition out of the life of college football into what I'll call the post-life of the civilian world. Now that part so was like- We're so regimented when we're in that world, but after you graduate, you're not part of that world anymore. Deuces. Yeah. So. How did you transition? How did you fill your time? How did you stay organized or on task after that? Man, it was uh, it was bad. Um, of course, I was still at that time, you know, with not with not too many offers um, or opportunities. I ended up playing in a in a low totem pole, for lack of a better word, an all star game in D.C. or in a uh, plan trying out for Winnipeg and Saskatchewan and Atlanta, you know, so the football opportunities weren't there, you know, so that didn't happen. Um, trying to find a career, you know, I, man, I ended up, um, there was a company called uh, Country Fed Meats. So I was, couldn't find a job, was uh, selling meat in a box, driving mm -hmm. around in the company truck, you know, and part of the sales pitch was, you know, slamming on the ground and said, this ain't no row kill, you know, you know, I have Vanderbilt degree and I'm selling meat. Uh, yeah. You know? And so at that point, where were the um, alumni? And I think a lot of it and a lot of the disdain or the, the bad taste in our mouth was, uh, you know, we graduated. So, we, you know, we're, we're not looking for a handout. Right. Uh, just a uh, hand up or network of people in teams and, and, and yeah. alumni or, you know, boosters or whoever, whomever. And you know, that really wasn't in the, in the late eighties, early nineties. I don't think that was there. I don't think that. Oh, it wasn't, there. but we, we would hear rumors of uh, some of our, we love them. We, we fight for them and fight with them, but some of our Caucasian brothers would, that mm -hmm. was the case. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you're like, yo, what, you know, Okay, well, all right. I mean, I'm, I'm glad for my brother because he's my brother. Mm -hmm. But you, you're treating him differently than you're treating me. Mm -hmm. I got love for him. But where's your love? And you have love for him. Where's right. your love for me? Right, yeah. right. So, yeah, it, it was there. So, you know, just as what we do and what I've done and what I just keep it moving. I, I'm not going to cry about it. Uh, you asked the question. I'm telling you, it probably would have never said anything. Unlike my brother Carlos, you know, he, you know, so our other guys like Los, they would be yeah. uh, more vocal about it. But you asked the question. That's the truth. Uh, so I sold. 
Vanderbilt degree, 1992, December, uh, human and organizational development and economics degree, uh, and I'm selling meat. No, and, and it, it's, I, I, I certainly don't bring it up to embarrass you. I bring it up because it, it's your story. Absolutely. And it shows you can, you back then you could graduate from Vanderbilt, but we didn't have that network or that network didn't fully exist to everyone to help you move or transition to the next phase of, of life. And yeah. I think it's vitally important. To and it is. Stories and, like and, yours. And to that point, man, you know, I, I haven't, and of course, a lot of us have with the bad taste in our mouth. There were guys, man, who were from the older programs, um, your John Pointers and your, and your, you know, several of the guys, I can't think of their names at this moment, that, you know, that try to help us along and bring us on. But, you know, the network wasn't there. And of course, we aren't helping a lot of us who have that bad taste in our, in our mouth from that side. We aren't helping to break the cycle either. Some of us are. Alan Young is doing, the, I know he's doing great things. And that's just one name that I know of that. Uh, but there are some of us, including myself, you know, you keep it moving and you keep grinding and you're making it happen for yourself. And uh, that network, of course, in realization, there's some things that I could have or could be doing for our uh, uh, for our young brothers and and you and will and you, and you will. Alan's yeah, coming will. in a few weeks. Yeah. The Black and Gold Club is building that network. Um, hopefully, you've joined it. There's there's nothing to, to there's no cost to join. It's just making yourself available. We're doing stories like this. We're having this show each week to kind of bring our community back <coughs> together of all decades of former players. But the fact that you're sharing your story tonight, Marcus, does that in some way. And let me say this, it brought up a thought when you said something earlier, man, I, I have no regrets in my life. And I get the word, I get the, you know, a lot of people have regrets if they've done, they've done something mm -hmm. horrific, you know, they've killed somebody or they've oh. caused some, done something. I have no regrets, good, bad, or indifferent, because mm -hmm. all of it, all of them have shaped me to the person who I am. They've given me the pains and the hurts and the internal chips on my shoulder. They've, they've taught me how to move and, and, and treat people. And they've given me that internal drive to make it better for myself, for my children, for my, for my family. And you know, also next level is to help it do that same thing for uh, some of the young guys that are, that are there. But I have no regrets, no regrets. Everything I've done, I've done it full seam ahead, full of young and vigor and all kinds of mistakes but I've learned from them and I am who I am and I'm a better person because of it. I, I, I don't have anything else that can top what you just said. So I'm going to, I'm going to pause. I'm not going to end our conversation because I know we've got more to talk about, but I want to be respectful of your time and the folks who are watching this tonight, but I want to pause us for now, Marcus, if that's okay. That's your, your story is beautiful. The fact that you're sharing it and sharing it with so many, I love that. That's why I'm doing these shows, that these conversations. That's why I asked you to come on. It's been far too long. It has. You and I have seen and, each other or yeah, had any I, conversation. I said it offline, but man, I commend you for your platform and for this platform that you're creating to help create these, um, these conversations, the dialogue and the healing that needs to take place. Uh, with me, with our, the rest of my teammates throughout all the years, whether I know you or not. I love you, brother, and uh, we're going to make it work. We're going to make it happen. Marcus, I love you too, my friend, and thank you for coming on tonight and talking with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't hang up just yet, but guys, next, next Tuesday, it's a roundtable discussion. I need two more to join us. We're talking about that transition from life after college ball and things that, and I've got four or five topics for us to go over. I think it's a fascinating conversation. I don't think that, I don't think enough people share their journey that would help people, help guys who are getting out now because they shouldn't feel like they're doing this on their own. Right. And that's why we're doing this conversation next week. Please join us. And we've got a whole bunch of great Commodores coming up. This weekend, we've got South Carolina 6.30 kickoff at home. I'm going to be up there. I hope to shake everybody's hand, hug some necks, and break some bread over this weekend. And as always, anchor down. Anchor down.
Amen.